What are you doing? I'm trying to relax. Looks like you've been doing some weeding this weekend. Mm. Um, yeah, and today especially. I don't have any special fancy photo shots tonight, boy. I am tired. But the garden is not tired. And before peak bloom passes us by, um, I think we should do just a quick um, garden tour just on this beautiful sun garden and the cottage garden, which, you know, is starting to really be in full color. Um, there's just lots of stuff going on, lots of gorgeous plants. I'm missing my butterflies this year. I don't know what's going on, but I'm like out here every minute I can, just like stalking, waiting for my butterflies to just flutter by. Um, we have lots of the typical um, butterflies, but obviously the monarchs are not here yet. Um, we're waiting for all the caterpillars on the dill to go through metamorphosis and come out as black swallowtails. So I know those are gonna be a little um, later on, but I do miss my, I do miss my butterfly photos. Uh, but anyway, so let's talk a little bit about this garden. Um, the garden is 10 years old. I mean, probably over 10 years old. And I did not start this garden this size. I started it around this little, I should say a big rock. Um, there's a big flat rock in here. And I started this garden right here. Just a little, little garden, couple of plants, kind of started landscaping around it. And then little by little every year, I just started moving and edging over. Um, this was an oval. It was kind of pretty ugly when I go back and look at pictures. <laughs> but what happened was, Every time I would go on garden tours and nursery visits, I would find something I just could not live without. Uh, and then I would have to take up a little more land, edge it out a little bit more, kept adding things. And then I would kind of rearrange every year as the garden shaped up, multiplying, digging, dividing, and just, you know, making repetitious sections of the things you love and that your zone loves. So this is just one of those gardens that I absolutely love every time it's in full bloom. Like I love all my other gardens, but when this is in peak bloom, I mean, I, I'm up at like six o'clock. I come out, I check out the window, I look down, I'm like, oh, it's just so much fun. Anyway, so that's that. There's tons of cone flowers in here. If you know me, I'm like, I, I literally have almost every variety of cone flower. Not really, but I have a bunch of cone flowers. Some are hybrids, such as this little lovely lolly, which is really unique. It's not really doing well because it was crowded in the very beginning. Um, I had to weed out some of the euphorbia around it, but it blooms beautifully. It's very unique. I love it. Pollinators don't love it, but I love it. Um, but then we have other things like intense orange, which is gorgeous. It comes out really bright and vibrant. Um, and then as it gets older, it kind of fades to this sort of tomato soup color, which I don't love. And I always cut the blooms off so that it stays vibrant. We have Baja um, Burgundy. I think it's Sombrero Baja Burgundy. One of my favorites. That keeps intense color all the time. And the pollinators do love that one. So I have sections of that. I have repeated like six different areas because I love red. Um, I love the bright colors. Obviously the native cone flowers, always a pollinator favorite. I have those scattered throughout the sections of this um, garden. And then I have little hybrids like this guy, which is salsa red um, sombrero. It's so beautiful. It's really bright. It's much different than the intense orange, but man, cone flowers make the, the color just absolutely pop. So I have scattered sections of cone flowers everywhere. They are one of my top, I would say my top five. They're in my top five for favorite plants, flowers, color, for performance, for functionality, for pollinators. It's like, they're up there. They're one of my favorite plants, in case you can't tell. Uh, what else? What else do we have going on? I have lots of stuff that I started plugging in um, for, also the monarchs, like butterfly weed, um, some native plants, which I have some uh, meadow rue back there also. I have um, the liatris, which are the spiky purple flowers back there. Those are gorgeous. Those come in white and purple, and they really are like, they're amazing. When they, when they bloom, I actually need to multiply sections of those 
um because my goal was to have more purple in this garden which i did a little bit um this year but i definitely love those they want full sun or they get kind of floppy and leggy so just make sure they get enough in there um i have a dwarf goldenrod in here and then the cardinal flower so i have great blue lobelia cardinal flower and i have the regular good old red cardinal flower and they're just starting to come in I don't know if you can tell, but there's like these little red um, buds. These are just now starting. Those are a hummingbird favorite. So if you know me, I love my hummingbirds too. That's one of those things for them. And then the great blue lobelia is really a late season. It's beautiful. It's a bluish purple flower and it's a late season bloomer. So when everything else is kind of looking, you know, ratty and it's kind of going down to like that dusty mauve color and you're getting those fall tones and everything's fading, that and the red um, cardinal flower really come up um, nice and strong and kind of help out, as do the sedums. And you'll see I have sedums tucked into the border as well. Beautiful, like these don't get any taller than a foot, really. Uh, I have that one. These, like there's so many different varieties of sedum, so many different color combinations, different flower head um, types. So it's really just a matter of what you like and what you plug in. But I do like, if you notice, like this is a limey. It's a little bit lighter than the rest of them. And I think it plays really well with the colors, like the bright orange and the bright reds. So you can always tuck in the dark purple ones. And then you have the limey ones in the back. And it just really gives your garden like dimension and depth. And it helps move your eye from one place to the other like you need help in this garden. I don't know. <laughs> the color, there's no color scheme in this garden. It is as much color as I could possibly shove into this garden. One other plant I wanted to highlight was the um, Bleeding Hearts Heliopsis. I'm sure if you have followed this channel, you know that this was one of my ultimate finds over the last couple years. And it does really well here. It does get aphids. I don't ever do anything about the aphids. Like you can take your finger and kind of run them up the stem and like squish them if you want to. I stopped doing that and they actually do not kill the plant. They don't make it look terrible. As a matter of fact, you can't even tell that there's aphids on this. And it's food for other predators, which actually will help bring in the beneficial bugs. So I have kind of changed my, my, um, my thought process on trying to get rid of aphids because we really kind of want them as food for the ladybugs and other predators that are around. And if they don't kill your plants, what do you care? <laughs> so I don't care. You just killed a bunch of innocent aphids. Well, over the last couple it. years. Mm -hmm. hmm. The last couple years I did. How many plants did you hide in this garden? From you when I bought them? Yeah. Tons. Tons. As a matter of fact, there might be some still in pots that have kind of rooted out the bottom holes. <laughs> that has happened to me before. Um, and actually plants are pretty resilient because if you leave pots on the nice soil, they will continue to grow out the bottom of the holes. I, I have learned that. And that is really terrible. Hey, oh, these dogs always gotta show I up. Know. So um, this is 10 years of just trial and error, basically. I, I don't know if it's 10 years of trial and error, but it's definitely the first few years. The, the thing about gardening is if you want, let's say you want to do this whole garden in your zone, you know, all these plants are hardy in zone 5B, or zone 5, they're also hardy in zone 6 and 7. If you wanted to take this garden and put it just like it is in your yard, it's going to look totally different. Because every little, every place, every location, things grow differently. Baja Burgundy may only get 18 to 20 inches here, but in your yard, it might get 30 inches. There's a big range of, of heights and um, mature sizes based on your sun exposure. So how much light it gets all day long. Um, and also how crowded you have your plants, how great your soil is, how happy it is, the acidity. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things that go into, a lot of variables that go into how well, how big, what the mature size is gonna be in your yard. So while everyone's like, how can you do so well with cone flowers? I honestly, it, they love it here. I really do not have to do much to cone flowers. I know that sounds terrible and I'm just like, oh, you know what, I can just grow them. But here they do really well. So if you have an issue with 
growing certain varieties of cone flowers change the variety. I will tell you, I have learned that there are hybrids that don't, they're not happy anywhere. They will not look great anywhere. I'm gonna give you an example because I have one, but I will not get rid of it because I love it so much. <laughs> Where is it? This one. See this little lovely? So this little guy, this is a double scoop raspberry and you can see it's kind of leaning forward. Those are sloppy, floppy coneflowers. I love the color. They are along the same hue, but I love the shape of the cone on that one and I love the shape of the bloom. But that one, no matter what you do, how much sun you give it, how much space you give it, how much fertilizer you give it, it's always gonna get top heavy and flop. The stems are very weak, they're very thin. And unlike these guys where they have really probably twice the, the thickness of the stem, those guys, doesn't matter how torrential downpour, you know, torrential downpours, major thunder, lightning storms, doesn't matter. These stand up and that is just gonna, whoop, they're like peonies. So there are varieties that are terrible for any zone that you're in, even though the flower is gonna get you to buy it at the nursery. <laughs> I have had many, many um, trial and errors in that regard. So I do know that certain, I, I will buy a few different varieties and try them. If they don't do well, they don't do well. I let them kind of fizzle out and replace them with something new. But I will always refer you back, if you have questions on coneflowers, I'll always refer you back to the Mount Cuba Research Trials for Echinacea. They, they have an online, basically a guide for all these different echinacea that they trialed for their overall vigor, their overall plant health, um, pollinator hits. They just did so, they trialed so many of them. And so that really will give you an idea if you are new to coneflowers, which ones really have the best like sort of immune systems and the best uh, plant habit and the best flowering power. That's always a really good thing to have. They didn't have that back when I started buying coneflowers. <laughs> so I have a little bit, I have a mix of like the last 10 years of coneflowers. Some of these you can't even get anymore because they just don't make them and they always are onto the new, you know, the new varieties. But for the most part, you know, my favorites are, are the ones that are still in here and the ones that are just expanding. And there's a few in there that I tolerate because I love them so much, but they're not fabulous growers. They don't do amazing here. They get disease and leaf spot and that sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, and we have a big issue this year with I was pointing to that white flower right yeah, there. Yeah, we'll get to that guy. I have a big issue this year with my cone flowers only having cones, which would make sense if they're cone flowers only, but Looks they should like have petals. Cone head. So the thing with this, you would not know if I just snap pictures of this garden, which I do all the time, you would not know that I have any issues here, but I have issues. It's been a very wet year. There, um, there are bacterial uh, leaf spots that show up on your cone flowers. You can have stem rot where the whole thing, you'll know because um, the bottom will get really buggy and really black instead of looking healthy and kind of dry and green. It'll get black and you'll be able to pull out the stems just like that. They'll come right out of the ground. That's stem rot. Then you can also have like leaf spot. Uh, I think Baja's actually had some leaf spot on them this year because of the rain. And we just got nailed. Yeah, we have a little bit of leaf spot here. Let's see, see how they're kind of like droopy and we have these like black spots on them. That is also a little bit of bacterial and fungal infection. So, um, but that's normal because we've had a wet year. So you also just have to know what your climate and conditions are in order to diagnose your problems. But in the case of the cones, the missing petals, like luckily the cones are really bright. <laughs> But this is what I want. Like, what is this? This is grasshoppers eating my cones and Japanese beetles. Um, not much you can do about grasshoppers unless you want to spray pesticides, which I will not. So I do tolerate this. Um, I also save seed from my cone flowers. So I'm leaving them. I'm not thrilled about this. This has gotten progressively worse over the last few years. But... Um, the one way you can battle grasshoppers is to know their life cycle. You are actually supposed to disrupt 
the first couple inches of soil um, where they, they lay their eggs. So the females will go in, lay their eggs in the top couple inches of the soil. If you go in and disrupt that soil and those eggs go to the surface, they're gonna die over the winter. So that's kind of what you wanna do. You wanna disrupt their life cycle. I have not done that yet. I have not tried it. I will be doing it this fall, however, uh, because it's really starting to be really noticeable. This was not this bad last year. Is there a petal club for men? Hmm? Cone flowers? Oh, for their baldness? Yeah. Very clever. But this is happening too. This is um, Picabella. And Picabella is supposed to have big, beautiful petals um, with the orange cones. And it's just, so it's happening a lot to my cone flowers, so I will be disrupting some of that life cycle and trying to get rid of some of the old grasshoppers. What else? We have a St. John's wort, that's Sunny Boulevard St. John's wort, which is finally starting to bloom. Beautiful yellow back there. I like that that's a little filler plant. And new this year, well actually new last fall, I had gone to a plant sale at the Hollister house in Connecticut, and this guy was selling ironweed. And now if you know ironweed could be like six, seven feet tall, this is a three foot one. So this is the first year, so it's a little shorter. Next year I expect it to be a little bit taller here and it blooms purple, it blooms later, it's a native, it's wonderful. It's like one of the really, you know, awesome plants that you need to add to your garden, which I have wait long, I've been long overdue to add it. Uh, but that is finally in there, it's looking good. It's not being affected too much. Um, and then as you pointed out, this is actually not planted. Oh. <laughs> oh this is a, um, an Asiatic lily and it's called Muscadet. And it is gorgeous. I actually bought a whole bunch of these for the farm. And because it's been so wet and we don't have a place to, to plant them all, I had potted them up. And what happened was the deer ate them. I had potted them, they looked great. And then the deer came and like mowed down the top of all of them. And this is one that survived and it was open today. And I came out and I'm like, oh, I love this. I'm getting more of these by the way, because that, I mean, oh my God, it's gorgeous. And so it smells, <sighs> it smells amazing. So anyway, so it's in here. Did you breed that one today or not? No, I didn't, I don't, I have not bred those. I, I'm not really interested in breeding those, but um, I stuck it there because I needed, there was like a hole there and I wanted to get a picture of it surrounded by beauty. <laughs> so I got a, I stuck it there and you know what? It looks darn happy. So could you hybridize that lily with that lily? No. Because they're different types. Yes, look at their reproductive, even the reproductive stuff. See this? Yes. This is the pollen, um, and then but if you, I have um, tree lilies over there that are in bloom. I for, I think it's called Levon. So that one is blooming over by the trellis by the arbor, and that one I could cross with this one. And then you'd have to wait for the seed pod to form and save the seeds and grow them. I, I, I do enough of that with the day lilies. I have not gotten into that, and honestly, I'd rather just buy the big beautiful bulbs and get those. I mean, that that's just gorgeous. And it smells so good. The fragrance on those, you know, like the um, the Oriental Little um, Lilies. What's the big one? Stargazer. You know, they smell amazing. They look amazing. So, yeah. But anyway, so yeah, this garden. Oh, and then other exciting things. So the last couple of years have also added different types of viburnums to my yard. Primarily because every viburnum I have never produce berries i would it would have amazing bloom they would bloom like hydrangeas in the spring it was crazy and then all of those seed heads um they would like start to form and then because i didn't have the proper cross pollinating viburnum there would be no beautiful seeds in the fall well let me show you something this year i have look at this so this bloomed and look at so normally these would be shriveled up and dying off, like just like, you know, non-existent. And this year there's tons of berries. Well, tons of things that are gonna turn into berries, hopefully. And then back there, there's also one that's loaded with seeds. The only one that didn't do it was this one. So this is what happens usually for me on my viburnums. This is where they bloom. And you can see, this is like up and down the stems. This used to be the beautiful white blooms and then these would turn into red berries had I had another one to cross pollinate it. When you don't get your berries and you only get blooms, 
That's why it didn't get pollinated or you don't have the proper cross pollination um, viburnum to get the berries. So I have, I have a match <laughs> because I'm finally going to have seeds and I hope they're beautiful and red because in the fall, they're great for the birds and their color. They provide late season color. So I'm excited about that. Um, so that's a new addition. No, these, these have been in there, but they were small. You know, when you buy viburnums, they're like, you know, they're little. These are just now, I mean, look at, they're like four feet, right? A little over four feet. So they're starting to put some substance on. Uh, and then, you know, I love my black truffle, my black truffle cardinal flower too, right? So this, I was talking about the great blue lobelia and the regular red cardinal flower. This is the same thing, cardinal flower, but it has dark foliage. This one pouts. If it doesn't get enough rain or watering and it's hot, it will pout on the ground like a two-year-old, literally. Um, so well, I know that about that. That's why it's tucked in there <laughs> because there are other plants it can't really flatten out too much because the other plants kind of help it stand up and this year it doesn't need it because we've had so much rain that it doesn't even matter anymore uh, but in a normal dry year that will definitely be something that you have to water what else joe pie weeds looking good no damage on joe pie weed i'm a little concerned about that because usually something is eating the crap out of those leaves what is joe pie weed right here joe pie weed is the really tall ones behind the mighty chestnut day lily here that's just starting also, I got a question about um, daylily bloom times. So there are different um, times for daylily blooms. You can have extra early, you can have early to mid season, you can have mid to late season, or you could have a late season bloomers. So there are different letters when you um, read about the daylilies. If you're getting them from a hybridizer, which is the most reputable way to go, or from the lily auction from reputable sellers, uh, they will most they will always tell you when the bloom time is for the lily that can vary a little bit i've had some like you know mid season bloom mid to late season blooms come to, like early to mid so it really kind of depends i feel like on your climate but for the most part you'll get you can figure out who's going to bloom extra early and fill in some color with day lilies um, based on their typical bloom time and you can usually find that out um, either online or from the seller in the listing when you purchase them. The Mighty Chestnut, always a late bloomer. Late starter, always a late bloomer. Um, any of the clown, um, I think there's a, I forget what the line is. There's a line of day lilies that has a really late bloom time. But anyway, so that one, I just know, see the buds are still starting to form. All these other ones have been blooming for weeks. So, I kind of like it because when the when the ruby spiders go, which I'll be sad about, um, then the orange mighty chestnut comes in and I've had those for so long and there's so many. So that will bloom for weeks also. Uh, but that's another way that you can extend your, your color and your season is by getting certain plants that bloom at certain times. Anything else I should cover in this garden? You have an awful lot of lilies this year. Lilies, which, which kind? Many. Asiatic or day lilies? Um, well, let me see. Let me think about it. Day lilies? Yes, day well, lilies. Uh, why wouldn't I? You want to see a really crazy one? This is actually one of my favorites. Well, you know, they're all my favorites. Right here. And now this has gone through like all day today. It's a little worn out. But see that guy? And what is that? Called? I'm going to show you the picture when it first opens. This is kind of bleached. Um, from the sun a bit, but that's a purple, that's a purple seedling. And it's kind of bleached out to like a lighter plum color right now. Um, and then there's Cheryl Mae Taylor over here. That's a very popular one with the hybridizers because of the edge on it. See that? See, she's looking a little weathered right now because we're doing a late day tour. Yeah, it looks like her eyeliner uh, yeah, bled all, with the sweat. All the day lilies are kind of like, you know, they last for a day. So by 7 o'clock at night, they're kind of like, eh, their colors are kind of not faded. But in the morning, oh, man, you cannot beat day lily blooms in the morning. And what are these? You better know what those are. <sighs> Come on. Uh, they're $125 lilies. <laughs> 
Festivus. Am I correct? Festivus. Where's the seven hundred dollar lily you were confessing to? Okay, so it didn't bloom. This Are year. you kidding me? No, I am so ticked. It's funny because someone commented on the video. I want to see the six hundred. It was actually six ninety eight. I actually went back in and checked. Um, it's right here. <laughs> Okay, so the good thing is it multiplied. I now have one, two, three, four fans. Not one scape has it put up. So I'm a little pissed off about it. But it bloomed last year. I'll show pictures of it. But it like last year was the first year I had it. So it was like I got like one, you know, scape. It didn't really look good. This year it came up amazing. But I think because I haven't fertilized and I haven't done the compost, I haven't, I haven't done the mulch. I'm giving it's probably establishing, but I'm making excuses for it. Yeah, it's I'd happy. say it's for seven hundred dollars. I know. And I really was like, oh, I, I couldn't wait. Like if I cross it with things, then, you know, so it's similar. It's similar to the one over there. That's a seedling. Um, that was one that I grew from someone else's cross. I purchased seeds for. And I love that one. This one is even better. Like from the picture anyway. Well, so. you should have gave him a starter check. That way he would have showed up <laughs> this year too. Oh, you paid I, him in full, but, 700. But, but when, when it blooms, like it, the thing is you can't buy that. So I have something, that's what makes it valuable. Really? So is that $2,800 there right now? Because I, almost, it, yeah. Really? I don't know if anybody's be as crazy as me. To, well, to especially it. if, you know, it didn't bloom. Is that normal for a lily to one year say, yes. you know what, I'm just not doing this? Yeah, um, especially if you're growing them from seed, that is very normal because it takes two to three years for a seedling, for a seed grown daylily to bloom. So I grow them in December because I want them to bloom early. This year, I don't know I'm gonna get any seedling blooms because it took me so long to get them in the ground. And I don't know if it's even gonna happen. But like this guy, right here this is another one that i bought it was not anywhere nearly as pricey as that one but it was the same hybridizer and now i have it multiplied great but it didn't bloom and last year it bloomed so it's almost like he they dug it up sent it to me it was already ready to bloom so i got a, a kind of a crappy bloom like i did on the other one um and now it's really establishing so next year i'll have like four fans meaning i'll have four scapes and i'll have a great show next year so it's kind of a bummer also my favorite one if you remember from last year i had that really purple it almost looked like a venus flytrap when it opened it was this dark gnarly purple daylily and it kind of opened like you know the jaws of life oh, yeah. uh it was really cool and this year i moved it and i moved it here and it didn't like that. It actually, it bloomed last year and it was a seedling and this year it didn't because I moved it. So if you disrupt it, it does take a little bit of time to get some day lilies established. Um, but yeah, so this is the whole line. I'm in love with this one. Check it out. That's a clown pant seedling and you know how you know. Stripes. Oh, I broke the, I broke the petal. Ah, that's all right. That's what I get for doing that. He and was this on is his another last one. hour anyway. This one, ooh, this one's pretty faded, but man, that one is gorgeous in the morning. Gorgeous. Is um, that the same one right there? No, this one doesn't have the stripes, but it is a clown pant seedling. So it does have the striping in the genetics. So I am crossing this back to ones that did come with stripes. So we'll see. We'll see. We got some craziness happening here. We got some, these are kind of really worn out. These look good. From today, but here's another one with stripes. And this one has a really cool pattern. So these are kind of like first, you know, first time bloomers. See this guy? He's not really this rust color. He's a really dark terracotta color in the morning, but he's also, see the striping? Uh, that, you know, that has that in the genetics. And this is a beautiful, I mean, it's got beautiful patterns. Check this one out. That has lots of ruffles. But it kind of looks like a lot of the other ones that I have. So, you know. But anyway, this is just, see all these babies? Some of these haven't bloomed yet, so I get to see. This one is out of, um, there's a seller under the name Gramps. It's Ed Burton on the Lily Auction. He has amazing toothy crosses that he sells. So, like, in my opinion, super cheap. Like, you can get, they, he starts the bidding at, like, 15 bucks for seeds. And he's always really generous when it comes to getting free seeds. 
um, with every purchase. So I like growing his stuff too. I have, I've had a lot of luck with his, with his day lilies. Want to see, what do you want to see? Should I want to see the... something over here. Looks like you got some color. Um, this is all Kismet Raspberry cone flowers. Um, these are, these are like the just typical, typical day lilies. A little Catherine Carter, she's kind of washed out by now. Um, but I do like the way that these mixed in. So I grew all of these from seed, which is why you see, <laughs> you see different varieties and colors. Like, look, there's a Mamma Mia color and the green twister, which I grew specifically from, for, from seed. Um, and then the native ones, I got white in there. And then Kismet Raspberry is one, it's a hybrid, but it's one that I bought and I had purchased and now I have a sea of it. I don't think I need that much there, but. I think it's kind of cool. I like the sunflowers up mm -hmm. there. I like how it has like, when you just throw it in there, it looks like. I didn't just I throw know, seeds. Skittles like I, almost. I grew all of these from seed, much like I did over there. You see what, see that um, holding bed over there? That's where I had the dahlias last year. And because the dahlias didn't do great over there, I had plugged in the cone flowers that I grew from seed from my own mix. That was really fun because there is a whole different slew of colors over there. Uh, and that's all just a mix from what I collected. So I'm kind of like thrilled about that. But that's what I did here. All of the ones that I grew, I don't know what the colors are going to be. But the plants, when they grow really well, I just plug them in here because you can't ever have too many coneflowers. I have to rearrange this. There's like a little hole in here I don't like. And I have to harvest some lupin seeds. Um, we have lots of that. Lupins did great this year, which is the first time I've ever had lupins do great. I mean, it did good last it year. It doesn't look like it did too great. Well, it's kind of done. It's producing seed now. So, and you know what? It's been neglected. I had to weed a whole bunch of stuff out of there just to see it. Uh, and the deer have gotten to some things, but I have a couple of day lilies in here I could show you. See, now's a really bad time to do it because like the magnificence of this does not really show through. But this is Outbreak Prime from Top Guns Daylilies. This one, so this is interesting because the buds are kind of just starting on this one. This is a seedling that I grew last year at a late starter and it's blooming kind of later. Like the buds are just starting to come out. So it's got the same type of uh, bloom time. This one is gorgeous. I love this one. That's a seedling also. This one is Blessings Beyond Measure. That's a that's a registered day lily. So someone actually created that and I have it. And then these are, you know, these are all bleached out, but they're beautiful. Yeah, I have to be careful so, because there are so many colors. The camera can't handle it. I know. And then this one is Heavenly Magic oh, Moments. Oh, that is nice. That one in the morning, like it's so vibrant. Well, you so, were out here early this morning hooking some lilies up. I, well, oh man, I I must have crossed. I should have a lot of seed crosses available this year. Oh, watch out! Whoa! Yeah, um, you always seem to tell me a little too late. Well, I don't really know. Oh, look at even this one. This one is so pretty, even when it's washed out. It's like a blue. It's like a lavender. It's very pretty. And we have brown delicious over there in Asheville. Open arms from Blue Ridge. Oh, I got them everywhere. But for the most part, it's been a decent year. It's been a decent year. What else? Uh, go to the cottage garden. I think we kind of went there and then took off. But yeah, we're getting late in the season, so it gets dark a little earlier. So yeah, we might have wanted to start this. A little bit earlier, but we have things to do. So one thing, we've had a super wet season. You know, Phlox is really prone to powdery mildew. Glamour Girl, not an ounce of powdery mildew on it, and I have not done a thing to it. I mean, the deer did, you know, chop it off in the early beginning, but if the if the deer get to it early enough, it will actually just come back and rebloom. Now, does that come in different colors, Glamour Girl or? Glamour Girl is that color, That's but it. there are different colored flocks. You can get white and red and pink and. I kind of like that. Yeah. Is it related to the wild flocks that we see out no. by the roads? And that's not really wild flocks. I think that's related to the mustard family, which is not. You're actually not supposed to like those. But they're pretty. I know they're pretty in the meadows and stuff. Um, what else? Blue chiffon, Rosa Sharon. Gorgeous. 
It is looking good this it's, year. It's amazing this year. I think it really loved the rain and it loves the bees and the Japanese beetles are not attacking it this year. And I'm not sure why. I'm sure they're attacking a lot of other things because we've been it's hard to get in there, chasing but... them around. But oh my gosh, it's so gorgeous though. This color, like this is a, this is a color you can't even make up. It's, it's great. How um, old is that? Gosh, years. It's, it's I, I don't know. I kind of wish I did. I would have like put when I purchased things, but that would mean that I'd have to be super organized, and I am not that. And you would probably. And be... I moved it about twelve times before it happily rooted <laughs> there. Yes. <laughs> um, the tree peony is making buds for next year. This is a promising seedling. I love this one. This is that terracotta one. He's kind of curling up on me now, but look at—he's got a beautiful edge. Um, so I did a lot of crosses with that and it is making pods. So that's exciting. And then summer solstice coneflower, another coneflower that I love, um, that is very happy here and it didn't do well the first year I had it. I mean, the, the first year it came back over winter, it was very small. It was not happy. And then it just started doing amazing things. And I actually have more of it down here. I was able to divide it. So it, sometimes it just takes time and patience, which is very hard for me to... It looks like it's it. almost done, though. No, it's being annihilated, much like the other ones. At least they're leaving some things. So the uh, seeds see, are right here in this pod. So when this gets pollinated by the bees, yeah. um, each one of these little bracts or, or little spiny things underneath has a seed. So if it's pollinated, it will produce a seed. And God knows where it would be pollinated from. In that garden, I love to collect the seeds because it could go from, I have so many varieties in there that that's when you get fun ones. I think it would be kind of cool to just take all the cone flowers and mix all the seeds up and then just plant it in one we garden. Could, we could probably do that at the farm. Yeah, just see what happens. We could, we could totally do that. Mass confusion, mm -hmm. like abstract Well, that's what flowers. happened, but that's what happened over in that other garden that we were just at. Yeah. I had the green twister and they're white and the mamma mia and the native and the, and then behind that in the dahlia bed, from last year, all of those, I mean, there's strawberry red, there's bubblegum pink, there's there's white, there, it's just so cool to see those come in. Uh, but anyway, so I, in this garden, I have like also repeating sections. So I have Glamour Girl there, there, and the deer ate it back there. But then I also have the asters coming in. Look at this thing, that wren constantly hollering at me because she's nesting in there. but. Excuse me. Looks like she stole some food. I think, no, I think what she's doing is taking out the eggs and cleaning out their little sacks and stuff. You know how they like basically take the diapers out of the nest? You know how the bluebirds do that? Diapers? Well, when they poop, they're like these little sacks and they take them out and get rid of them so it doesn't stay in there. But they're hollering at me. All day long, this thing hollers at well, me. And I get it. Well, better watch out. We might get attacked by crap. <laughs> Gonna drop um, little crack bombs. The, the hydrangeas are doing great though. I have the hydrangeas. What else? That selectrum. That's that really tall, like right now it's almost like eight, nine feet tall. <laughs> Stay there, I'm gonna show you. If he doesn't like try to dodge me. Never have I had this grow that tall. I know, what is the deal? I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, and we have quite a few back here that have self seeded um, and I'm letting them grow. Like we started out with like one plant and now I have this little section, super slow, but they're, they're getting so tall and wispy. I love it. And then when this gets super tall, this should be the same size as the hydrangea. So, you know, th this got revamped a little bit last, was it last year I did the revamp or the year before? Two years ago. Two I years believe. ago. So that's why these are kind of still establishing. And I have a butterfly bush in here that wasn't, it didn't come back really right away. It took a little while, but now it's kind of filling in. But I think it's starting to get shaded by the hydrangea over there, but that's okay. So what is the name of that big tall thing? Selectrum. Selectrum. D-H, Selectrum. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's beautiful, da very dainty leaves, just tall and wispy and pretty. And the birds use it as like a little stair to get into their nest. <laughs> That's why it's bending over. He, he's, he lands on it and pushes it over. Otherwise it would be straight up and kind of cool. 
Uh, and then the Pinky Winky Hydrangea, which is always amazing. That thing is, that has officially recovered from the deer. Remember the deer ate down the whole uh, right side of it? And I've been cutting the left side down and letting the right side grow in for like three or four years now. And it is finally pretty much back to normal. So I'm happy about that. Anyway, so that's that. I mean, this is pretty much peak, peak, peak bloom. Even though we have other things up and coming that haven't bloomed yet, this is like the hot summer color bloom. Um, I don't know, you can't beat it. Even, even with all the neglect, it has been, you know, it has made me happy. And I'm happy to have spent the weekend in these gardens because it really kind of just rejuvenated me. Even though it's hard work and you're out here and it's like, ugh, you get filthy. It, there's like nothing more rewarding and satisfying than looking in here and not seeing a super ton of weeds, like not seeing a mess and just cleaning it out and being like, okay, there you go. I'm like, I'm putting some time in. Well, we did, we did weed it like a month ago, right? You a, and me. A month, I, yeah, but not that much. We did the edges. Well. We did the edges so that when we did a video, it didn't look like we completely <laughs> neglected yeah. it. Um, and then I tried to like, you know, expose the rock edges and stuff like that. So it doesn't always, it doesn't always work to like keep up on the edging. The mulch definitely helps keep up on the weeds. I will say that because we'd have such a wet year, any exposed dirt has like immediately sprouted weeds and it will sprout like tomorrow. The next time it rains, this will all start filling in with weeds again. But the mulch definitely helps that. But I don't think we really suffered too much this year without mulching because it's been so wet. We haven't had such a drought like we did last year that the mulch helped last year. Um, but this year it's been so wet that it didn't matter. I guess we picked a good year to, to neglect them. So is it too late to mulch or would we... No, we uh... can, you can absolutely do it. Sure. Well, I got a whole pile. I got about 16 yards down there. If you yeah, really well, maybe we should just keep it covered and save it till <laughs> spring, right? Oh, uh, yeah. What's the difference? Why might, waste I... it now? Would it be a benefit to have the mulch on there through the winter or no? It would be beneficial to have the mulch on there right now so we don't have to weed as often. But you know what? Weeds pop up whenever they want. So, um, But it is like now we're not, we have like, three days of dry weather. So now is like, okay, they've been babied all, all season with like this rain, literally every day there was a, th a thunderstorm. And now it's kind of like every three days in the forecast, we have some rain predicted. So it would be great right now if we really just filled in the open spots with mulch. And then once it rains, it allows it to dry out for a couple days. The mulch will help retain the moisture in the, in the soil. So it would be good, but I don't have the energy or the time to do that. And I just want to say it's been a pleasure to be back here and just in my gardens and involved. And I will have butterflies. <laughs> I must have butterflies. Um, they are part of the joy. So I'm enjoying this color, but I also do it for them. And I'd like them to come visit, and, you know. I did feel kind of guilty sometimes walking around the yard and being like, wow, I haven't done anything up here this year. Yeah, it's been crazy. We, we've, this is kind of the first weekend, um, you know, other than the, your birthday weekend, which was a month ago already, uh, we haven't done much. Like we have these like one day hits and oh, and if it's raining, it's great because everything gets canceled and we get to stay home. And then we tackle stuff in the rain and the bad weather. That's pretty much how this season is going. It's weird. It's almost like mowing the lawn and getting caught up on things here at the house is relaxing yeah it, it it is bizarre even though like today like we're so like i'm filthy and disgusting and and i feel so good <laughs> well we got a lot done today yeah i got a lot i got a lot done the holding bed we got i i got weeded um and i got like just the patio area needed some of the crabgrass to be pulled up again my fountain is out i'll have to do a little like i'll do a little celebration about that because it's out but it's also back there, that patio corner, there's a lot of green, not a lot of flowering plants. So a couple of the, like the Amsonia that was kind of, um, it needed staking during the last video, 
that I need to take out one because they got so massive. They're really good filler plants and they only bloom in the spring. So I may take those and use them where I need to fill in holes, but I can't, I don't want to have three massive three foot sections back there. It just, right now there's not a lot of color. So I'm like, no, <laughs> I got to add some things with color. So I'll probably take some of the cone flowers over there in that dahlia bed that's way behind or in the holding bed and I'm gonna I'm gonna add some more cone flowers back there because it definitely needs some color but it's been good I I'm happy we got a lot done things look good despite our neglect and can't really ask for more than that no hey looking great again honey and like you said we didn't even try this time <laughs> well yeah but a lot of a lot of this is established so it's not there's not a lot of new stuff in here everything that's in there is pretty pretty much been there for a while so well you just gave up the fact that we're just using old footage now and you're standing in front of a green screen yeah right <sighs> you know what that would be easy sometimes if i could just be like oh no i like to show the progression of things though because you don't always have a perfect season you always say you're gonna have a perfect season and you're gonna keep up with things you know we bought the farm and i'm like oh everything's gonna be amazing this year Woo! Boy, I got knocked on my butt with that. Um, got a lot of issues, but I'm focusing on what we do have and um, the blooms that we're getting and just making a plan for the future for the things that aren't going so hot. And there are plenty <laughs> of things that are not going so hot there. Uh, but I'm excited to have that shape up. I'm excited to bring some of the plants from home. Like my gardens are pretty stuffed, so I'm gonna dig and divide this fall. I'm also gonna dig and divide some of the existing daylilies that I have um, huge clumps of and try to sell some so that I can make some money for some renovations and plantings at the farm. So if you like what you see here, stay tuned because I am gonna pot them up um, and I am gonna offer them for spring shipping. Uh, I'm definitely gonna dig and divide this fall and then ship in the spring. So. I have to start making room for some things and, and I have to maintain the gardens. They can't just keep growing and growing and growing and get overstuffed because then you really will shoot yourself in the foot and have disease and pest and then lack of bloom. And nobody wants that. So is it safe to say you're not gonna expand any of these gardens? Oh, no, I am, I am probably for the first time ever not expanding one thing this year. I have actually planted less I have not even been to the nursery other than for clients. Um, I have not gone for myself. I have lots of points I need to use. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't even know where or what I'm in need of. I'm so upside down this year. But I do know I need some color for the back patio. So maybe a new cone flowers in my future. I don't know. Uh, but it's been fun. It's been, it's been an exhausting year. I definitely am happy to slow down a little bit right now and just um take all of the things that i expected to happen in my brain that aren't going to happen and sort of swallow that i have and i'm moving on with what is doing well and what i can focus on and just make a plan for next year or really the fall we have a lot that's going to happen in the fall at the farm so and a lot here we're going to take massive chunks of stuff dig and divide some is going to go up for sale some is going to go some are going to go to the farm for planting so we have a lot of, a, we have an overhaul that's going to happen here if we can hunker down and get it done. Do you see yourself doing gardens like this at the farm or is the farm going to look more like just uh, like kind of what it does now? Where you just... I'm definitely going to do gardens at the farm. Definitely. I, I might take this and put it at the farm. <laughs> I'm going to like, we, I would love to do it in front of the fenced area where the paddocks are. Um, but I have to lay it out. I, I'm not ready for that yet, but I do want to have some of the plants there and growing in the ground so that when I'm ready, I can, I can dig, divide place where I need to have them done. Um, but I'm definitely going to do gardens like this because it's full sun. Uh, I'm going to do lots of pollinator. I'm going to do a lot of, um, demonstration gardens. So this kind of a garden, um, a native garden. I'm going to do, um, post plant garden. I'm going to do just a whole bunch of different th types so of things. So they would be like display gardens and then you'd be like, hey, if you like this plant, I got one in a pot out back. Like um, that type, 
type of well, deal? I, well, yeah, but and also just to give people ideas and sort of inspiration, like to take, you know, perennial gardens. Because this garden may not look great at the farm, but there's a version of this that's going to go there. Because one, that's what I love. I like this style garden, and I want that. I can, I can just imagine with the setting there, just having sections. And maybe I just do miniature versions of this in the corners of the paddock surrounding the flower, the cut flower fields. Like I'm going to have perennials. You have to have perennials, but I don't want perennials in straight lines. I want perennials that are functioning as a garden and as beautiful, like as a beautiful surrounding and setting. Yeah, but wouldn't you have a hard time like taking a perennial out of your garden if you were to sell it? Wouldn't you want it to be in a different garden so you could just dig it up and then it wouldn't affect your display garden, right? What do you mean? Like you wouldn't say, if I was somebody- I, would not, I know what you're saying. I would not have a garden like this and say, oh, you like that? I'll go dig it for you. Yeah. No, yeah. That, if you like that, I can tell you the name of it or if I have them, I mean, I could eventually, but it, it's gonna take a lot of plants and a lot of like a couple years to get enough stock and you can always grow from seed. Like I'd be better off with the cone flowers, um, collecting my own seeds from here and just mass planting potted cone flowers. So the ones that bloom, if I love the color and they're unique, you know, I either keep them or I could sell them. They're those, those are hybrids. Um, and the ones that come up as the native echinacea go in the fields. I mean, the pollinators love them. It's, a, it's there's no lose situation there. Um, so that's probably a good plan. Plus starting cone flowers from seed is amazing. Uh, not all cone flowers will come true to seed. So if you plant, let's say kismet raspberry from seed, you collected your seeds off of that plant and you planted them or fiery meadow mama collected the seeds, planted them. They're probably going to come up in the native purple. <laughs> they don't always come true to seed, but what happens is if you have a whole bunch the bees can help you and you'll get that one off and this like really cool different varieties and different colors. Uh, and that's the fun part about that. And then there are some like the Pow Wow White, Pow Wow Wildberry, Green Twister. Um, those you can grow from seed and they will come up as Pow Wow White, um, Wildberry and Twister. So some will come back as from seed and some will not. So. There's my little helpful hand. Wow, you learn something new every day. Yes, but you? if you plant a bunch of them, like I did the other, like last year, I've had great, I've, I've had some come up white, some bubblegum pink, you know, I've had so many different colors come up and I'm like, oh, and then some have like two-tone colors. Those are my favorites. Those are the ones that I'm like, oh, that's amazing and unique. And that's what you get when you have so many varieties and the bees are around just hopping from plant to plant to plant to plant. You're always gonna get those couple seeds that are gonna produce something fun. So that's that. Looks beautiful and so do you. Had a great time walking <sighs> around doing the tour. Thank you. Yes, this I mean I wanted to definitely sneak this in today even though we probably weren't entirely prepared <laughs> or energetic enough to do it, but I mean, how can you not when, you know. It's fun to be out here with this. I kind of just want to get a couple of lanterns and some chairs and sit out here, maybe have a glass of wine. Really? What do you think? Shall we do that tonight? Sure. We'll have a little a little snack from the garden. We did harvest carrots and we harvested cucumbers and tomatoes. Um, have microgreens. So maybe we'll have a little healthy snack and some wine and- A little bonfire. A little, little lancer now here. No, I want to do it here. Oh, well. I want to just be out here. Sounds chill. good. And then when it gets really dark, we'll go to the fire pit. A little blanket. Well, maybe a mattress. It's hot. I don't know about blanket. You want to sleep out here? You Maybe can. A comforter. <laughs> Feel free. Um, but yeah. So this is that. It has not suffered too much despite our neglect. So things are still things are still kicking around here. All right, honey. So, all right. Hope you all enjoyed it. And if you have other questions, let me know. See ya.